we're going to be coming back to you as a church with some uh, ideas on what that would mean for your participation. Some of us could participate in $10. Some of us could participate in much more. Uh, but our goal is to try to see if we can truly make that anniversary as a time where we can, we can uh, celebrate and recount God's faithfulness, but also we can look forward and launch into a new era free from uh, the burdens of the past. And God's been faithful, and we've seen uh, over this uh, way back, and it seems like COVID has been with us forever, right? Way back at the beginning of 2020, uh, we as pastors were looking at that, and nobody knew, and, and churches did not know, and organizations did not know what was going to happen uh, to our organization, to our church, in terms of finances. And what has happened at Emmanuel over these last couple of years is that actually our giving has gone up. Uh, our, our investment on behalf of you as our people has gone up consistently, so much so that we're giving above what we budgeted, uh, as we budgeted very conservatively. So I think the potential for us to do that, and I would love to have that. I'd love to have a nice big ceremony where we could light it in a fire in an appropriate place, not set off the fire alarm in here, uh, but we could light it and let it go. Uh, and as we think forward then uh, to what God wants us to apply those resources to in the years ahead, what kind of ministries, what kind of outreaches, what kind of things that he's want us to do. Uh, and we're truly looking outward. We're not looking uh, to use those funds to make a cushier place for us to be. We're looking that for, to fund uh, more active ministry for the lives in, in the lives of people in Xenia and around the world. So uh, as you're thinking and praying about that, as you're looking forward to uh, this year, I hope you're praying for that, and you'll hear more of that as we move our way along, and we hope that you'll plan to participate as best you can. I want to begin with a word of prayer uh, this morning. There's a, uh, many of you are in good places today, uh, and you're doing well, uh, and life is going okay. All the Cedarville students are back. They've had uh, syllabus shock. They know everything they have to do for the semester. They're slightly depressed, but they're trying to, to move forward. Uh, in terms of that. Some of you, uh, you didn't have to face the syllabus, you just face your everyday job, uh, and it's still the same uh, kind of things that you have to do. But for some of us, uh, these are seasons of grief and difficulty. Uh, I want to pray for Adam and his family, in particular with the loss of his dad, D, uh, just this week. I want to pray for them, for their uh, blessing and mercy. I uh, thank God that D was a godly man who loved the Lord, who left a sweet legacy, uh, so that the grief uh, has a very, very uh, bright hope uh, surrounding it. And so we want to pray for them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Sarah and Marty are walking through some difficult things with uh, Sarah's dad uh, in particular. Uh, our own Donna Hauser uh, is struggling. Leslie uh, is struggling as well. So there's a number. So would you join with me and let's pray together uh, for those in our body that are hurting. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace today. And Lord, we need your help in every way and in more ways than we're even aware. Uh, Lord, we know that, that you have brought us to yourself by your mercy. Uh, Lord, you've come after us and you've taken rebels and made us sons and daughters. And Lord, you've given us a spirit and you've made us new. And Lord, you've enabled us, Lord, to come to life even now. And Lord, you've promised us everything that we yearn for. But Lord, we know we live in a fallen, broken world. And we know we're waiting for the king to return and ultimately establish your kingdom and deal with all the enemies that face us. Lord, the decisive victory is won, uh, but Lord, the, the consummate victory is yet to come. And so, Lord, as we walk through these days, uh, Lord, we, we know that we're going to face suffering. We're going to face illness and disease and reversals. Uh, Lord, we're going to uh, expect to have hardship if we uh, boldly take your name as our, our name and, uh, Lord, represent you in the world. And so, Lord, today we want to come before you and Lord, we pray for uh, Adam and his family. We pray for your mercy on them. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would encourage and strengthen them. I pray that you would guard them and protect them in their grieving. I pray that they would grieve with hope. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would sustain them. I pray that it would be a sweet time of celebrating uh, your goodness that came to them through thee. And uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that everything that you want to accomplish in the lives of the people that were affected by this man... Lord, uh, let that begin and let it happen, uh, Lord, as they reflect on his life. Lord, there are some uh, who need to turn to you. There are some who need to return to you. Uh, there are some, uh, Lord, that need to be encouraged. Lord, I pray uh, for everything around that funeral service. Lord, I pray for Marty and Sarah that you give them wisdom and strength to love well in these hard days. Lord, I pray for Rufus for his blessing. Lord, we pray for Donna. Lord, we pray for her encouragement and comfort. Pray for Leslie and for Tony, that you would bless them. Pray for Leslie's recovery and blessing. 
And uh, so, Lord, uh, there's some that, that I haven't mentioned, some that are here that are hurting. I pray, Lord, that we would come to you. Uh, Lord, we're trusting you as we just sang that we're going to see goodness because goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives. And so we commit that to you. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, well, turn to the book of James with me, will you? Let's go to James chapter 1. Uh, and uh, we're going we're gonna to catch up a little bit from last week and uh, do a little bit of clean up, and then we're going to move into our passage today of 1, 12 to 18. And uh, James, as we, as we recounted, is writing to a group of people that best be described uh, as refugees, um, uh, something that people around the world today are very, very familiar with. Uh, we have a number of places where there are, there are a multitudes of refugees who are fleeing from political oppression, fleeing from violence, uh, all kinds of tribal conflict, those kinds of things that are happening, or whether uh, they're, they're minority groups in large countries that are being persecuted because of their beliefs, uh, all kinds of things that are happening around the world. And so when James writes, like, count it all joy, right, consider it joy when you fall into various types of difficulties and challenges, right, uh, James speaks to the reality uh, that we all face of uh, finding in, uh, to broken, in a broken world with broken people, we're going to find broken places. But he's writing to people who are in the darkest places. And so as we come to read this, James is offering hope for the darkest times of life, right? Uh, as I mentioned to you last time and joked with you, many people in the two-thirds world or the 1040 window as they refer to it, uh, look at us in, in the West and they laugh at us when we uh, translate and, and interpret James chapter 1 uh, because our, uh, and even, even a phrase has come out, first world problems, right? Uh, like uh, I'm driving to class on Monday morning and daggone it, all of the parking places are taken and I've got to walk an extra 200 yards. Up, oh, James 1. Count it all joy when you fall into various difficulties, right? I got to Walmart this morning, and the, the shelf was empty of the only thing I went there to get, right? And so I was upset. I wanted to let somebody know, but I restrained myself, and I said, count it all joy when you fall into various difficulties, right? Uh, because that was super difficult. Um, and again, uh, the issue here is the first world problems that we have, yeah, were there difficulties, and yes, we need to respond to them appropriately, uh, but, but this is a God who's big enough for when everything comes off the rails, everything. Every expectation is not met, and when you find yourself literally scrambling for your very life, not for a better seat at the table, not for the right thing that you wanted to buy, if you will. And so James is going to talk to this group of people, and he steps in and he says, we need to count these joy because we understand that there's a sovereign God who stands over all these things, and as we sang, surely goodness and mercy follow us, and he's going to be at work at a deep level to accomplish something really good. And we're trusting him. We're trusting him to do that. And so the way we're going to navigate those difficulties is we're going to need help, right? It assumes you're going to have difficulties, and it's going to assume that you need help to get through them because you're going to need to help. So what do you do? You call out to God, and God gives you wisdom, okay? And so as we thought about the issue of wisdom, okay, uh, we call out to Him, and wisdom is where you look to God in humble trust to give you a reminder of His character and His purposes to help you know how to approach the situation that you're in, right? Wisdom doesn't see from James to be, you know, uh, God, I'm driving into the parking lot. Should I, should I park on this row or this row? God, give me some wisdom, right? And then God says, that space right there. That's not what he's talking about. It's not, he's not talking about, you know, God, I'm not really sure about my major in school. Which one should I take? Uh, business, because somebody from the business department just walks up to you and says hi and introduces themselves, whatever. That's not the kind of thing he's talking about. As we work through the book of James, what he's going to do is he's going to bring the wisdom of God to bear on their struggles. And what he does is he goes to the Word of God, what God's already revealed about himself and his character, and he says, this is God, what, who God is. This is what God has called you to be. This is what it means to love your neighbor. And if you brought that wisdom to bear on this moment, you would not be behaving this way, right? So this counts on the fact that what God is going to do is bring to mind the things that he's already made known about himself. These aren't some private word that's going to be unique to you. Sometimes... 
right? I'm conscious in my own life that God has done those kinds of moments where it just seems like he's giving something unique and specific, but those seem to be the exception rather than the norm. The norm is that God grows us and shapes our heart, our passions and priorities to be like his as we appropriate the means of grace that he's given us. Well, what are the means of grace? The scriptures, our prayer life, the body of Christ. Well, those are the shaping influences that we engage in and we submit to with a humble heart, and God uses those to change the way we think about ourselves, to think about God, the way we think about the world and our mission. And over time, as we walk into different situations, we don't say, God, give me a specific word about whether I, could, I should date this guy or not. No, you look into his life, and you see if he has the priorities of Jesus that are governing his life. And if you're a follower of Jesus and he doesn't care for Jesus, then you, know, you don't need a special word from God, don't date him. You don't date him, right? Because you know this is not what God has for you, right? When you get your money that comes to you from your check, you don't have to pray and ask God, should I give some to the church? Should I give some to your work? No, that's all my money, God says, and you should be supporting the places where you're fed spiritually. That's the way I've wired it. So I don't need a special word to have me to do the things that God's already told me, and these are the kind of things I need the wisdom to bring that word of God to bear on this moment in terms of how I should behave and act. And so you ask God, and then he says, well, you ask in faith. You trust him that he'll provide. Now, here where we want to begin is in verse 5, and I want you to come there with me if you would. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. Well, one of the things we want to know, uh, some of you, right, have had dads like this, or maybe you are a dad like this, hopefully not, or a mom, uh, or a friend, right, that you go ask a question to, uh, and they respond to you with like, how many times am I going to have to tell you this? Right? Come on. Right? And they punish you for asking the question. They may eventually answer the question right after a while, but they're going to ring you out before they give you the answer. Right? Uh, I just did that for you just a minute ago. You're asking again? Right? Well, sometimes when we think of God, right, we put onto God right, the person that represented God to us, like our father or an important figure. Right? And then we envision that when we come to God, that's the exact same way he's going to respond to us. And instead of letting God be the example that says, I don't respond that way. I respond to you generously. I want you to come to me. Matter of fact, that's what I'm longing for. I want you to come, and I love to give you wisdom. Right? And I'm never going to rebuke you for coming to me. I don't care how many times you come. Right? As, as your dad, I want you to come to me because you need me and I want to guide you in terms of life. So he's generous. But then he makes this one kind of caveat, this one qualification. He says in verse 5, uh, and it will be given to them, but when you, verse 6, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Okay? Now, Belief is a posture of humble trust in God's presence and goodness compelled by a deep understanding of God's character, right? So you're coming with, I believe God is good, I believe he's powerful enough and his wisdom is sufficient, and I'm coming to that posture. And it's also, as we're going to find out, if you're coming with that posture, whatever you learn of God, then you do it if you really trust him, right? So in the moments where we're in difficulty, we may not understand why, things are happening. We may not understand what's going on, but we do know the one who does know why. And so we go to him and say, God, the only way I'm going to get through this difficulty is if I have your wisdom, because I need guidance, I need direction, I need, to, to, uh, uh, I need focus, I need settledness in my soul. Right? And when we do that, right, to give you some examples, these are some of the wisdom, some of the, the, the words of wisdom that you're going to find throughout the book of James that are going to come to us to remind us, especially in those darkest moments, right? So this is not random or pointless. God is up to something good for us and others now and forever, right? Now, I don't understand in a moment when I'm sitting in a hospital room, when I'm standing there at a casket, uh, when I'm sitting in a, a doctor's office and getting a, a, a scary diagnosis, right? 
uh, when I've just been uh, unjustly treated by someone else or my character has been slandered or someone has done something to me that's used me or abused me. I, in that moment, I don't know why that occurred. I don't know what God's purposes uh, are, are in that moment. I do know that if that thing was evil, that it is evil. But I'm trusting God that God is at work, to use a C.S. Lewis phrase, there's a deeper magic here at work. I'm trusting him because he's good that something good is going to come out of this even though this moment is very difficult, right? So it's not random or pointless. God didn't fall asleep. You know, your guardian angel didn't take the week off and have a holiday, right? And all of a sudden, you go, oh, oh no, there's Marty. Oh, I forgot you. Sorry, Marty. I'll pick you up next week, right? Nothing like that is going on in terms of God. And then God knows what he needs to do to transform me and work through me to accomplish his good purposes for me and others, right? One of the unique things about each one of us is your life is not mine. Your path is not going to be mine, right? And we're going to wonder, well, why do I have a different path? Why didn't I get the the best path? Uh, Even among the disciples, there was always a question. uh, The only one among the disciples, the original 12, that is thought to have lived a life and died a natural death is John. The rest of them were all martyred. And right at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus tells Peter, Peter, they're going to arrest you and you're going to be crucified to tell him what death he was going to die. And Peter goes, he looks over at John and he goes, hey, but what about him? And Jesus goes, Peter, that has nothing to do with you and me. Peter, trust me and follow me. Right? And so many of us, there are some people in you who have chronic illnesses and other people who have never been in a doctor's. There are some people who grew up in intact families with with all kinds of of, of blessings that came to them. Others of you have never been a part of an intact family. Some of you have grown up with material provisions, and others of you have not. Some of you uh, are born ready for Instagram fame. Others of us, there's no way we can attain it. Whatever the case may be, we have differences in life. But I'm trusting that God knows what I need right, that he's going to do what he needs to do to bring me to life and to make me maximally effective for the blessing of other people. And what he needs to do in me is different than what he needs to do in you. And we know that the transformation that God wants to work in us is so deep and so thoroughgoing that that if God were to make us aware of, of, of exactly how deep and thoroughgoing it is, it might discourage us from the outset. I think God just works at us little by little to bring us to life, doesn't tell us all the ways that we're broken and we're distorted and we don't get him and get ourselves, and little by little over life, he's going to bring us to life, right? Some of you remember one of the most famous moments where Paul, right, if you want to read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I I remember reading this and thinking about it seriously for the first time when I was in college, and uh, he had something given to him, he calls it a, a, a thorn, a scallops, something that was absolutely horrendous. He begged God three times to take it from him. What did God say? No, no, no. Until Paul got inside the truth of it, that God in his mercy had done something, a severe mercy for him to restrain his arrogance so that he could give God the glory and direct people's attention to God and not himself. Right? So as we think about what God's doing, I'm trusting him that he's at work, right? Second, evil comes from below, from the evil desires that lurk in men's souls, not from God. We're going to look at that a little bit later in 12 through 18. But what what we want to make sure of, and this is the oldest thing from the garden forward, right? The very first thing that, that, that Satan wanted to do to Adam and Eve is to convince them that God was not really good, that God's withholding from them something that they would really be good for them to have, but God just wants to keep it from his, for himself. He's selfish. And he doesn't really want your best. And that becomes the predicate, that becomes the foundation to move people to doubt God's word and then to trust themselves over against him, okay? And what we're going to see, James, by this passage we're in today, he assumes that one of the things that the evil one is going to be busy doing, as soon as you have adversity, as soon as you have a reversal, as soon as things don't go well, he's going to be quick there right at the door to say God's not good and you can't trust him. That's the way he operates. And when you get into difficulty, there's only two ways you're going to get through it, right? 
Two ways you're going to wind up, and James has two different ways. There's two paths. You're either going to go down the path of trusting in God and drawing on his strength and knowing the life that he wants to give, or you're going to go down the path of giving into your evil desires and then giving birth to sin and then killing off your appetite for the things of God. So two paths to go, so evil comes from below. We're finite, and on the way, we shouldn't expect to understand everything that's going on, right? The arrogance that we often have that, God, if you don't explain yourself, I can't trust you, right? Uh, a God that, that we could understand wouldn't certainly be a God worthy of worship, number one, right? But number two, God's ways are beyond our ways, and Scripture is full of that, and we'd expect that to be true. I don't understand everything that God's up to on the world scene, let alone in my own life, right? And then, I'm deeply loved and secure in Christ. And again, we were singing from this passage today, Romans 8, 31 to 39. This is one of those passages in your darkest moments, you just need to go down and sit in it. Right? That really, things are not out of control. Really, I'm not just swinging in the wind. Really, I haven't been abandoned. No, the God who loves me, who is the judge that I've offended, he's the one who's forgiven me, and now he's my advocate, and nothing will separate me from the love of God in Christ. Okay? So key, key ideas I want to get after. Okay? So doubt, when we come to doubt here, what leads to doubt and what is it that is doubted? Okay? Now I want to suggest to you here what leads to, bout, to doubt and talk about a couple things here is often one of the cycles, there's a number of things that lead to doubt, but often it's, it's rooted in our own immaturity, our, our, idea that, our, our, our um, sense that we really don't understand God and we have a vision of him that's not worthy of him, okay? And, and we're not even aware of this so often until God doesn't come through on what we think should happen, okay? So I don't know what, uh, uh, what your goals are, what your hopes are, but, but every parent who starts off as a parent, uh, well, number one, uh, every couple who comes together, most couples, and I think they should, but every couple who comes together, they have this idea, we're going to start a family together. And you have a dream, and there's nothing wrong with that dream at all. Nothing wrong with that dream. It's a gift from God to have kids, all those kind of things like that. And all of a sudden, you find out that you can't have any children. And then all of a sudden, you thought, well, God, we, we've been going to church. We, you know, I married a Christian man. I married a Christian woman. We've been trying to uh, you know, uh, watch our, cross our T's and dot our I's. Right? We've been doing all these things. God, well, wait a minute. Why can't, why can't I get pregnant? Why, why can't we have a child? Well, then you even move beyond that, and you get a, a parent who has a child, and then you envision the kind of life that you hope you will have with the child. You hope that you'll grow close together, that you'll form a human being that will be respectful, that they'll turn to Christ, that they'll do all those things, and then there you sit, and they're a teenager, and they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And you're going, God, wait a minute. All those are the kinds of moments where we have this idea that, God, uh, I have a relationship with you that if I do A, B, and C, the things that you require, you will take all the difficulties out of my life. Now, on one level, that is true. God has taken all the things that really threaten you out of your life, right? What's the most threatening thing here is God's wrath. He's taken all that out of you, and what has he done? Secured you and made you his son and daughter, right? But there's nothing in Scripture that God says, I'm going to take out from your life every disease, every difficulty, everything that's going to happen, I'm going to relieve you of that, or I'm going to so work in your life that, that it's kind of a quid pro quo sort of thing. I do A, B, and C, and God does, you know, D, E, and F, and that's the way it works. And so relationship, uh, children, you know, are like little Play-Doh uh, uh, stars, right? That you, you follow the right formula, you put them in the little press, and you squeeze them out, and then there's a little star right there. Uh, and then sometimes we in the Christian community, we uh, inflict guilt on parents or we just quietly give it to them because you must have done something wrong because your kid isn't like they should be. As if you could control the states of the heart of your children. And they didn't have any responsibility for the choices that they made. Well, one of the things that quickly leads to doubt is, God, I thought I was doing all the right things and I thought that that meant that everything would go right. Well, that's an immature understanding of what it means to follow Christ. I don't have a guarantee. My wife doesn't have a guarantee today that I'm going to continue to stay faithful. 
by God's grace, I'm going to lean in on him on every day and pray for it and walk with my wife to be followed. But I cannot guarantee life. I can't guarantee that my next doctor's appointment is going to turn out well as much as I hate them. I hate doctor's appointments, right? So I'm a classic guy that tries to avoid them every time, right? But all those kinds of things are here, sometimes we have an immature view of God, and so then God doesn't fulfill the contract, and then we come back to God and say, God, you better explain yourself, and you fell down on the deal, and God says, well, wait a minute. I didn't make that deal. I didn't make that deal, and I'm asking you to trust me, right? I'm asking you to trust me that I know what I'm doing. I'm asking you to trust me that what needs to happen needs to happen for your blessing and for the blessing of the people around you. The only way you're going to make this is by leaning in and trusting me to walk through it, right? So often, it's the couple things that happen here is when God, uh, difficulties happen that break our expectations, we say, you know, God, are you, are you good and are you there? Are you there at all? Did you just, did you just lose sight of me, right? And if you read the prophets in the Old Testament, that's one of the things that often happens, right? As the children of Israel go through the judgment for breaking the covenant, they respond as if, God, are you there? He must not see us. No, no, no. He sees you, and he's acting to bring judgment because you broke the covenant. Is God good? Yes. And the, the recount the story is the good creator has stepped in to reclaim what we have broken, and he promises to restore all things and reclaim all things. Yes, he is good, and he's working at a deep level to accomplish the something that's good. But those are the things that be, we begin the question, is God there and is he good? Now here, I don't want to, to in any uh, uh, way suggest that the issues that happen in life and some of the things that happen in life are not absolutely heart-wrenching and, and, and horrible and, and, and difficult and weighty. Right? I know I mentioned this to you before, but one of my uh, uh, favorite stories, true stories, is the story of Johnny Erickson Tata. Some of you know her. Uh, she's from a wheelchair. She's an artist, an author, speaker. Um, but when she was a teenager, I think maybe an early college student, late high school, um, she was walking away from the Lord that had been commended to her uh, as a young person. And uh, I think even according to her testimony, she was preparing to get some... Uh, birth control uh, material so her and her boyfriend could get involved sexually. She went, goes swimming, dove into a pool. It was too shallow. She dove in and broke her neck and became a quadriplegic. In the immediate aftermath of this horrible accident, she tried to kill herself repeatedly. She's looking at her life as a young person of what seemed to be something hopeless, irredeemable. In the middle of that moment, God broke into her life and changed her around. And any of you that know her now, you go look up and read about her. Her wheelchair has become a platform from which she has spoken to millions of people, to the value of people who are disabled, uh, for the case of the unborn, and for the, for the sanctity of life. And she's borne witness to Christ from a wheelchair which has made her witness extremely and incredibly powerful. And she calls her wheelchair, this is her phrase, which she borrowed uh, from a man, Sheldon Van Auken, who coined the phrase. Sheldon Van Auken was a friend of C.S. Lewis, and he and C.S. Lewis were partners in suffering because both of them had lost their wives at a young age. His wife, Davy, they got married, become Christians, and right after they were getting into the sweetness of their, their new Christ-centered marriage, and she got sick and died. And C.S. Lewis's wife, Joy, got sick and died. And Sheldon Van Aken wrote his book, A Severe Mercy. And so Johnny Erickson Tata called her wheelchair God's severe mercy to her. Now in this moment, right, uh, these are the darkest moments where God stepped in and redeemed these moments and has used these individuals as voices in a powerful way in the lives of other people we're going to face the brokenness of a fallen world. And so when we come to these moments, we're going to struggle with trusting God to the degree that we think God is good and big enough for these things, right? Now, just give you a picture here, a little visual as we've, t as we've worked our way through. What, what does doubt do? How do you know when you're doubting, right? 
um, as I was praying for, for Adam and for Sarah and his family. You know, grief for a Christian, Christians should grieve. And this is where we, we're going to talk as we work our way through. And we said this last time, to be a person whose joy and who counts difficulties joy doesn't mean that you're always smiling. It doesn't mean that you're always cheery. It doesn't mean that you're the person who's always, you know, walking in and bubbly. No, it, a person who has joy has a deep vitality in their life, but their emotions are tethered to the truths of God. And so if you're a person that's full of God's passion and priorities, when you see someone in suffering, you weep with them. When you are, are go through difficulty and suffering that's a part of a broken world and the sinful world, it causes you to weep. But in that moment, right, grief can go sideways. Grief can go over into anger, right? It can go over into withdrawal. It can go over into despair. Right? Grief can go sideways, right? There's nothing wrong with grieving. Matter of fact, there's something wrong with you if you're not shedding tears over something that's dark and horrible, right? You should be. You should be angry at certain things. But why are you angry, and are you constraining that anger by the grace of God, right? Those are the things that should be happening in a right-ordered person. There should be nobody in this congregation who steps into the life of someone who's going through real deep suffering, and then you just pop off a few, you know, positive phrases and then bounce out of life and say, get over it, you know, God's with you, right? People who follow Jesus weep with those who weep as much as they rejoice with those who rejoice, right? And so what's happening to these believers here, we talked about this, they're disillusioned, they're abused, they've got crushed dreams, right? The, the people we're writing about were, were parents, like parents in here, who had dreams for their kids, dads who wanted to provide for their families, moms who wanted to have a kind of a domestic life with their families. They, they had visions for what they wanted to do, to be and to serve God. Now, all of a sudden, they're running for their lives. Things have just come down, the walls have come down around their ears, and as these kinds pile in, right, so what's happening in the book of James is God is not bigger than the circumstances, and so he disappears, right? And then what comes in, in the place of doubt is despair, right? Because you're thinking, well, God, if he was good, he would have done X, Y, and Z, so there must not be a God, or he must not be available, or he doesn't see who I am, and so I'm just really on my own. Or there's the idea of anger, right? You get angry at God, and I, I, I know I've shared with you before, in, in my darkest moments, I've struggled with that, right? Tried to go out, follow Asaph's advice, and not do it publicly, Right? When my oldest daughter Jacqueline was sick for a long time and she wasn't getting better and her, uh, uh, her ability to process oxygen just kept getting lower and lower and it wasn't turning around, I was scared out of my wits. And I, I know I've said, I had the question that was going around in my mind, can God be good and Jacqueline not go home? That was the question. And so I went out into the parking lot of Children's Hospital by myself and just yelled. I was angry. And there wasn't anybody with me. I was just angry. God. And I didn't have any verses that could strong arm God. Right? I can stand beside the bed and say, God, you said you would do X, so let's do this right now. God says, no, you trust me. You trust me. You lean in on me right now. I'm bigger than this. I'm good. Trust me. Right? Well, God disappears. Anger comes in. And then withdrawal. Right? I, I mentioned, I, see, I meet Christians who God has not, disappointed them. Something's happened in a reversal, and, and they're too, they're too uh, <clears throat> uh, angry and hurt to draw near, but they're too afraid to run, so they're just kind of withdrawn. They may show up, they may be here, but, but they feel like God has not followed through and not done that, and, and they're just disappointed, but they're just like an abused child. They're too, they're too angry to draw near, and they're too afraid to run. So just kind of hunkered there, right? And then what's inevitably going to happen, because we're not wired to carry pressure forever, you can't just sit there underneath that pressure. You can't stay under the anger or the despair or the withdrawal. You're going to turn somewhere to find relief, right? There's no way that you're just going to stay there and not find it. It's either going to collapse you in on yourself, or you're going to try to turn to some false savior to try to deliver you from it. And so... Uh, uh, I, here's some of the ones that, that are kind of the ways that we do, right? Uh, we rage at God and demand for Him to do something. 
we manipulate and punish through withdrawal from him or shaming him or offering him a deal. We bargain, right? You know, the foxhole thing. God, if we do this, right, I'll serve you my whole life, right? We turn from him, right? We turn from him. We turn to something like food. I'm going to eat my way out of this stress. And I'm going to eat my way out of it. Drugs. Right? We've got to have something to numb our pain. Right? And the vast majority, and you know it yourself, of the addictions that we face here in our area, in the United States, don't come from illicit drugs, even though there's a lot of that that's happening. A lot of it happens from prescription drugs. And we turn to them to numb the pain, to be able to live with it. Or we turn to uh, hobbies or pursuits, trinkets, right? We buy our way out of it. We distract our way out of it. We do things that we try to ignore it. Try to keep ourselves busy, right? Now, all these things, there's nothing wrong in and of, them, in and of themselves, but what they wind up being is that we turn to them to find relief. And of course, none of them ultimately offer any relief. And what they usually do is they just compound the difficulty, right? And sometimes as well, and we're going to find this in the book of James, is that instead of turning to the people that we need, we turn on the people that we need, right? Have you ever, you ever thought about the fact that sometimes the person that you love the most, who loves you the most, who puts up with you the most, right, who's around when you really need them, the person that you can really count on is the person that you often treat the crappiest, because you're not going to take it out on your boss at work or some random person at Walmart, at least I hope not, right? Or somebody that's, that's here or there, but all of a sudden, you know, you come home and you've had a crappy day, and so you just let your spouse have it, and you're irritable, and you're impatient, right? Uh, and everybody needs to walk around on eggshells because you had a bad day. And so the issue here is that we cope with it, pressure will come out somewhere, right? And you know where it's coming out a lot in this contemporary moment? in depression, anxiety attacks, right? It gets up so far, you're just not wired as a human being just to carry it indefinitely. If you don't find a release from God and help from God's people to release it, it will make your life implode. You will run somewhere to get relief, right? So this is where we are and what doubt does. And so he gives two illustrations then in verses 9 through 11, of the examples of how wisdom works for people on two ends of the kind of socioeconomic scale, right? So, you know, you've got a poor person. Some of these people that are being persecuted are just poor people that are going through even worse things, right? Their lives were already difficult, and now they're refugees, right? And then the other, you've got rich people who've been impacted if, by their faith in Christ, but, well, how do we navigate this moment? And he gives examples of what happens of the wisdom that comes to the lowly person to help them process this moment and what comes to the wealthy or the powerful person in this moment. So here he gives two examples. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Right? Well, what James wants the lowly to recognize is that they are truly rich now and forever, no matter what their position, material position, possessions they have. They are truly rich. As a matter of fact, they have every resource they need to navigate this moment. So they're truly rich because they're kingdom citizens. So they're actually being reminded that God is engaged in their life to grow them, right? And they need to draw on His wisdom, and they need to understand His purposes and step into them, right? So they're reminded of their elevated position. Societally, they're the bottom of the rung. But in the kingdom, they're full kingdom citizens with all of God's resources available that they can draw on. So they need to exult in the fact that they have everything that they need in this moment and that they're secure in Him. It's not a time for disappointment. It's a time to draw on the rich resources that you have. But yet on the other end of the scale, and this is why I think he digs into the rich more, is because they tend to think, I thought my skills and the material possessions that my skills allowed me to acquire would protect me from all these things. 
And what is a perennial problem of the rich is they start to put their security and trust in their skills and their stuff. And it's God's mercy in a time of trial to remind them that that stuff is all false hope. You making that the idol and the goal of your life, this trial is ripping that idol down. And that's God's mercy. Right? I don't care if you've got a, a, as much money as you could possibly have. It's not going to protect you from death. You're going to wind up in a hospital at some point in time like the poorest person around. You might be buried if you have more money with a nicer tombstone than somebody next to you, but you're going to be laying in the same ground. And it's God's mercy to remind you that you cannot, through your efforts, secure your own life or your future. And so this reversal steps right into the life and say, right? Remember Jesus in Luke chapter 12 to the rich man who stood out there? He says, man, I got my barns full. I got everything all set to go. Man, I'm going to live and, and eat, drink, and be merry because I'm as secure as I can be and I have everything that I ever wanted. And God steps right into that man's life and says, you fool, your soul is required of you. Right? So wisdom takes the, the rich and says, don't trust in your riches, trust in God. The poor, it says, no, trust in God. You have all the riches that you need. Right? So the reversal. Now, he comes then to the basic principle in verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So as he comes to this underlying principle, this really, in verses 12 through 18, is the theological truths that undergird every bit of advice that James is going to give. Okay? So as he goes through the various challenges that the people are facing in their refugee status, as they're running for their lives and trying to provide for their families, James is going to step into the various circumstances where they're, they've lost their way. And he's going, the premise is going to be, God is good, he's always good, every good gift you need comes down from him, and anything that's evil is not coming from him. So don't blame God for the evil that's happening don't excuse your behavior that is if God is trying to get you to do evil. No, God is good. He's always good. And he's there willing and ready to give you every resource so that you can follow him through this difficulty, right? So the blessedness, the person who's really going to find life is the person, right, who trusts in God, who turns to him. That's the basic principle. Then he's going to undergird it with the fact that God's character, right, cannot be impeached, right? And you can trust him. And then as we go through the rest of the book, he's going to say in chapter 2, well, if you really believe that God is good, then you wouldn't be elevating people who curse Christ in your church services, trying to suck up to them and get their money and power. You would be elevating the poorest person who knows Jesus because they're richer than the richest person who rejects Jesus. And at the end of chapter 2, if you were believed in God, there'd be no such thing as going incognito for Jesus and saying that you didn't need to provide for the people who are the least of these in your congregation, as if that's below you, or, or life is too hard for you to take on their responsibilities too. No, no, your faith would be observable. It would work. Chapter 3, if you really trust in God, you wouldn't put anyone in leadership whose inner world isn't governed by God's wisdom. You wouldn't put anybody. I don't care how desperate it is. It's better for you not to have any leader than to put that kind of leader in. Then he's going to come to chapter 4 and he says, you guys wouldn't be squabbling and battling each other and turning on each other. You'd be looking up to me and humbling yourself before me and asking me for everything that you need. And instead you're battling each other as if that person can get you what you need to survive. And instead of you being the family of God, now your competitors squabbling for the little bit of things that are left out there. So he's going to come at that all the way through and he's going, this is the theological truth. So the basic principle, God's blessing Genuine life now and to come awaits those who love him. And to put it this way, those who endure trials, trusting in and looking to God for deliverance. And so this is the basic thing. Now, I want to talk with you for a moment, and this is not in your notes, but I want to talk with you about what the blessedness is. Thinking about this, what does it mean that you're blessed? Okay? What, what kinds of things constitute being blessed? Okay? If you're thinking about what is James anticipating? Because we know, okay, and this is something particularly for us in America, 
To be blessed does not mean that you will survive the disease. To be blessed does not mean that the condition that you have will ever be reversed. Right? So we, uh, when we think about it, especially from the West in particular, we think about blessed, so what's that going to mean? Well, I'm going to be healthy, I'm going to have money, and I'm going to live in a nice place, and my life is going to be well and free from difficulties. That's what blessing means. Well, if that's what blessing means, nobody that James is writing to is going to be blessed. You follow me on that? Right, we're, we're key. As a matter of fact, there are strands of Christianity, strands of Christian teaching that says if you really are following Jesus, you shouldn't be unhealthy. If you're really following Jesus, you should be wealthy. If you're really following Jesus, everybody should like you because you should be happy, right? We call that the prosperity gospel, right? You do that, all these good things happen to you, right? I never can get to the prosperity gospel from the book of James, right? So what does it mean to be blessed? Let me talk about a couple things. Okay, one, I'm going to give you about five things. One, it includes the delight of pleasing God. To be blessed is to know the delight of pleasing God. Right? Now, I want to make it clear, right, as a believer, we don't please God or know that delight out of a sense of insecurity. I'm not trying to do the right things today to make sure that God will hold on to me. Like God's up there, you know, I'm dangling by a thread today, and he's going, okay, Greg, let's see how you perform. Oh, too bad, and off I go, right? No, I'm secure in his love. My motivation as a Christian is, is a heart that's getting what it means to be loved by Christ. And you guys know this motivation. If you've been loved deeply by anyone, it creates this dynamic in you when you receive it that you want to love in return. And when you, when you please the one that you love, there's a delight in that. Right? And interesting enough in Scripture, it says that one of the ultimate ends of human existence is standing before God and God saying, good job, Greg. Right? Now, any of you that have kids or you work with kids, you can see that happen when you see somebody who just wants their dad to appreciate what they've done. Or their mom, they come, mom, 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 come see this, come see this. And you come over and you see this drawing that's of unrecognizable figures, right? That is a, a very well constructed, this is our family. Mm. And this family doesn't look very well, actually. I'm not, not sure which are the different figures that are here. Oh, that's me. I'm, okay, mm, that looks really good. Yeah, I didn't know I looked that bad, right? All those kind, and you're looking there, and all they're there for, right, in their thing is they're wanting to say, Oh, honey, what a great job. Oh, man, I love that. Right? I'll draw you 10 more, right? So you can wallpaper your office, right? That's okay, honey. I love them. Not that much, right? So those are the, all the kind. But we know the delight in pleasing God, of, of pleasing Him. The second one here, as we please Him, that incentivizes us to continue to please Him. Right? When you do that which delights the heart of the Lord, you want to do more of it. Right? It creates a dynamic. Just like sin will deaden it and deaden your desires for the things of the Lord as you serve Him and you know the, benefit, the, the joy of pleasing God, it, it incentivizes you to do it again like a child. Like a child. And then also you begin to realize as you taste the joy of that, if you, you want to bring other people into that joy. So you, you, you get the joy of pleasing God, then it incentivizes you to do it more, and then as you know the joy of God, then you just want to bring people into it, right? It, it changes the Christian life. You're not about doing things because they're required of you. You're not a duty-bound person. You're someone who does it out of the delight of pleasing the Lord, and as you enjoy that, then you want other people to get a part of it. You're disappointed if they don't want to get in on the, on the, uh, on the racket. I want you to know him. Ultimately, it's not about just doing the right thing. I do the right thing because I trust that the Lord who said it's the right thing is that this is the path where I will know his love and please him. That's why, right? And then fourthly, right? 
it allows you to enjoy life. Okay? There's something about it to know, to know where real help lies. Okay? TikTok is not a good place to get advice. Half of what people aspire to on the social network is not worth a, a moment of your time. Right? The kind of people that so many people idolize are people whose lives are sad and broken and don't have any direction that is helpful for you to live out your life. but you get to know where real help lies. It lies with Christ and where wisdom is found in his word, right? What will truly satisfy you? So you you come to enjoy the freedom that God wants you to know as he's made you. Now here's the, the flip side of it. So besides knowing the pleasure of knowing God, of incentivizing you to do it more, of you becoming someone who just kind of bubbles it over, right, and shares it with other people, right? I've told you this before. When I talk to many people and they bring in all kinds of things into my office and, and, and uh, as a pastor, as a professor, I don't know what's going to walk in the office, but one thing I can always do is I can testify to the truth of Jesus and of life in him and of his goodness. And then I can try to help them find good answers. But if I don't know Jesus and walk with him, then I'm just providing some sort of academic uh, answer to a problem that usually is way more than an academic issue. So here's some of the stuff that he wants to protect you from, right? When you think about the things that are the blessed state, he wants to ex- protect you from the pangs of a guilty conscience, right? All of us have known a guilty conscience. Man, w- Psalm 32, what, how blessed it is to have your conscience free, Right? He wants to protect you from allowing the evil one to get a foothold in your life, right? As you doubt God and you leave yourself open, he's going to step in there and try to push you toward despair. Instead of turning to God in repentance to deal with your issue, he's going to push you toward shame so that you live in perpetual shame. He wants to encourage you to drown in self-pity. Say, woe is me, right? And so you become, you know, the resident Eeyore. Right? He wants to stoke your pride so that you rationalize your sin and you defend it. That's what he wants to do. Okay? Then, beyond that, you don't have to deal with the social consequences of sin. Right? You don't have to deal with the social consequences of sin. Either the things that happen to you or the happen- people that happen in your sphere of influence or the people indirectly that you impact that you don't even know are looking at your life. You don't have to deal with that. So let me talk about some of these. Families stay together. Reputations stay intact. Platforms of influence are not forfeited. Resignations are unnecessary. Excuses for unbelief are not offered. And there's no seeds of self-doubt or self-loathing that are sown in the hearts of our children. And what I mean by that, right, you and your wife, as you hang together and you love each other and you fight through your, your brokenness and you say, God, I'm going to trust you to continue to stay with this woman, with this man. I'm going to lean into you. And if things get out of control, I'm going to draw other people into it to, to help us, to counsel us, to hold us through, to get through. Why? Because I don't want my kids to ask the question, what's wrong with me that my mom and dad would abandon me? Wasn't I, I have had kids say this to me. Wasn't I enough for them to work out their stuff, to stay together? That's the kind of issue. God wants to save us from that. He wants to redeem us from it, and we've experienced it. He wants to bring us, but he wants to teach us to say, if you follow this path, those are the ditches I don't want you to fall in. I want to protect you from those ditches, and I want you to become a person who draws people out of those ditches, and I want you to be a person who testifies that I drew you out of a ditch, and you encourage other people not to go in it. That's the blessedness that he wants us to know, right, as he follows it. And let me say this one last thing. They don't have to disentangle themselves from the stranglehold of addictions, drugs, porn, social media obsessions, mindless entertainment, alcohol, right? When you run to false saviors, false saviors 
grab you with open arms and then put those hands around your neck and strangle the life out of you. Right? But in God's blessedness, that's not our path. By His grace, in His blessedness, He wakes us up when we fall into it and says, get out of there. He'll bring somebody into your life that's a body of Christ and come over and say, Marty, will come on. We say, Greg, what's going on with you? Greg, come on. That's the blessedness of, that God wants to hold out. So then he undergirds it with two pillars, right? In verses 13 to 15 and uh, verses 16 to 18. He says here, when tempted, no one should say, God has tempted me, for God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to death, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to uh, sin, and then and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death, right? So James says that when you find yourself and you get into a hard situation, right, when somebody mistreats you, abuses you, when something difficult happens to you that you didn't plan, right? In that moment, there's going to be a battle in your soul. It's going to start. And you're going to have to choose which direction you're going to go. Either one, you believe what he's going to say in verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. I think the reason he describes God that way is that God is the God of light who creates light who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth. He brought us to himself by the word of the truth, the gospel, that we might be a first fruits of his new creation. Well, either one, the pillar is, you're going to trust that everything good comes from God. I'm going to turn to him, trust him, ask him for resources, turn to his people in this moment of my challenge, or I'm going to let my own evil desires take me down the path of despair and anger, and I'm going to turn to a false savior, and it's going to lead to death. I'm going to have those choices as they encounter the difficulties of life, right? And let me say this about it too. You're going to have this choice not just with the event at the time that it occurs, but you're going to have this choice repeatedly as you're taken back to that event in your mind. You follow me on that? I find all the time that when something difficult, a reversal, a difficult moment happens in a person's life, is that at the, at the moment, God will meet them with grace and mercy as they lean in on him and they'll, they'll get up on their feet and they'll move forward. But what's always obvious is that there's a lot more work to be done in that area that's going to happen somewhere down the road, right? So I see Steve shaking his head at me. I see that happening in, in my brother Steve's life every time it's Joseph's birthday. It's not over. Joseph is not forgotten. The shape of that, that Joseph has cast on the souls of of Emily and Steve and their family, right? That's the thing that's revisited over and over again. And you take the same truths back to that. You can decide to respond in despair and anger. You can can rage and and do all those things, or you can lean back in on God and God, I trust that you're good, that that you've got all the provisions I need. I need wisdom from you to process this again and again, right? And so this is the, the two ways that James has in front of us. And so as we come here, I I put this chart, I'm going to make this available to you, is this is really what he's going after here. And I want to close with this today. We have to trust that everything that happens in your life, that God's not asleep. Right? Uh, We know that God is not, he's not evil, so he doesn't do evil things. And we know that he's not doing anything that's encouraging someone to be evil or to do evil. We know that. That's what he says about it. But everything that happens to us, right, God is sovereign over them. It's not that they're happening by accident, that God doesn't know what's going on as if they're outside of his own purposes. So any circumstance that God allows into our lives is accompanied by the resources needed to turn that circumstance into an occasion for our growth in his glory, right? Christianity has argued on and on and on apologetically. We have to believe God's plan does not exclude evil. We don't deny that evil exists. Matter of fact, one of the key things about Christianity is that there are evil things and people who are broken and turned away from God need to be redeemed. Right? It's not, a, and not an imaginary thing. It's evil, right? But what's very clear is that the evil that God allowed, either God won, allowed the evil to promote a greater good or to avert a greater evil. 
So I'm trusting that God has a purpose and I'm going to lean on him. And what are these teaching tools? Any of life's circumstances. And this is the funny thing about each one of us in here. What to you may be a trial, to me doesn't bother me at all. Right? And so you have a trial going on today from the same circumstance that I'm participating in, and I think it's great. Right? Just think of all the people, uh, this happens at school all the time, that you know, you get your random roommate, and you're a neat freak, and they're a slob. Right? And every day, as they look out on the slobbiness of their life, they just say, home right? I just enjoy this. And you look at it, and you're just about ready to freak out. You say, you know, disease, death, right? Uh, you know, ah, oh, I can't take it, right? And you're super organized, and they've never had, uh, you know, a, a location in their room where anything has ever gone back to the same place twice. And, and, and you're, you're just freaked out every day, and they're, they're happy for you to be freaked out, just as long as you don't try to freak out on them, Right? But they're walking in every day, and they don't, they're not bothered by it at all. And you're just about ready to go, I, I think I'm going to kill them, right? I just don't know if I can take it. Maybe I need to transfer out, right? Uh, maybe I'll organize it for them. Have any of you done that? Right? Just organized it for them. Uh, where's my stuff? I just laid it here. How did you even know where it was? You got three piles, right? All that kind of stuff like that for what's a trial for you. Some people walk in here aesthetically into the auditorium. They don't even pay attention to the aesthetics, Right? Some people say, I wish we had more basketball rims around creating you know, barriers around. Other people are going, oh my goodness, we got to get rid of those. Right? Whatever it is, it's funny how we're all wired differently, but anything can happen today that can cause you a real occasion just to freak out in your soul. Well, what are they going to be? Enticements to sin? Events in the natural world? All of you saw those crazy pictures about that volcanic explosion underneath the ocean out in and uh, the Pacific out there, Tonga or whatever it was, crazy pictures, right? Uh, relationships, right? Uh, we wish all of our relationships were always full of joy and sunshine and, and they always said the right things, right? That doesn't happen. Nasty surprises, careless acts of other people, right? We all think, right, that everybody in our life should be thinking of us above everything else. And when they don't, well, then we're absolutely offended, right? Why weren't you thinking about me? But those are the kinds of things that happen every day. And we get a moment, the difference that changes between a temptation and a trial is what we do in response to it. We know that God's sovereignty, he allowed that happen today and he give you, gave you everything that you need to respond appropriately to it. But if you let your evil desires take great and you turn away from him and don't ask for wisdom, he says it starts a process where it just, it takes root in you, that evil desire and then it'll give birth to an act of rebellion. And when you take, stand over against God, it'll kill off your soul. On the other hand, if you turn to God and you ask for wisdom, he'll give you the wisdom that you need. And some of the wisdom may be, this thing is so big, I just need to go tell my dearest friend, I need to cry out for help because I feel like I'm just going to fall. But I trust God. And wisdom, and it leads down to life. Now, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what the pressures are. I do know if you're not under pressure now, just give it time. Right? You know that? Just give it time. Give it time. Something's going to happen. And James envisions not things that we bring on ourselves, but things that happen to us because of we're in a fallen, broken world. You're going to read something in the newspaper. You're going to get a report from your home. You're going to have a friend do something. Right? Somebody that you thought is healthy gets sick. Right? Something you wished would happen doesn't happen. A disappointment, right? You've been working as a husband and wife on something and you have a lapse and somebody just doesn't follow through. All the kind of things are going to happen. And the question is for us as the people of God, do we really believe, and this is the fundamental thing, this is our, our scripture verse, do we believe that God is good and that every act Every good act of giving and every perfect gift comes down from him. And God doesn't have a bad day and he doesn't wake up and just go dark for a moment like some of us do. God is always faithfully, he's the same, and he's a God who is generous and he just is waiting for us through, as we go through this world. Paul said it in Romans 8, we're like sheep for slaughter day in and day out. As we go through those moments, God says, you turn to me and I will generously provide you with everything that you need to navigate it today. And I want to do something deeply, deeply good in your life through it. Hold on to me. 
trust in me. Hold fast to me. And I, I just say to you here, you don't hold fast in the difficult moments to someone you don't pay attention to in the easy moments. Do you follow me? You, you're, one of the things about trials is they will reveal what you really trust in. It's always really interesting to know where a person runs when everything falls apart. And if you're walking with God all along, if you're pursuing Him all along through the days that seem easier, it's just going to be habit that when things get really hard, you're just going to run to Him and hold on. Right? You're going to run to His people and hold on. So I want to encourage us as we're studying across the time to make the habit of regularly holding on because you need to hold on to Him today to be the husband that you need to be, to be the wife you need to be, to be the mom or dad you need to be, to be uh, the friend that you need to be, to be the neighbor that you need to be, right? To deal with the food in your life, to deal with uh, the temptations in your life, to deal with your insecurities, to deal with your fears. You need him every day for that. And as you create that path of just turning to him when it gets the darkest, you're already holding on. You're just going to hold on tighter. You follow me? You're already holding on. You're just going to hold on tighter. Right? Pray with me. David, will you come sing? Lord, thank you so much today for your goodness to us. Lord, you are good. And uh, Lord, we trust that you're doing good things. But Lord, we, we recognize our frame. Lord, we, some of us are, 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 are testifying to your goodness out of our pain. Some of us are, are enjoying a season of joy and, and um, uh, ease, Lord, relatively speaking. And Lord, we, we pray that you would help us uh, not to forget, Lord, that ultimately you're the God of the rainy days and the sunny days. Lord, every good thing that we have comes down. Lord, help us to trust you today that no one can get in the way of the things that you want us to know. No one can thwart your good purposes in our life. Lord, you're too big. Uh, Lord, you're too great. Lord, teach us as a group of people to constantly hold on to you so that when the hard times come, we just hold on tighter. Pray in the name of Christ. Amen.